waste management company, GFL Environmental, made its public debut earlier this week, both on the TSX and the New York Stock Exchange. Amid punishing marketing conditions, the IPO is the third largest in the history of the TSX, and it comes as there is a lull of sorts for Canadian IPOs. Patrick DeVici is the founder and CEO of GFL Environmental. He joins us now from the TSX. Patrick, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. Let's let's start with going public in a market like what we have seen over the last week. What was that experience like? I mean, obviously hindsight is 2020. Um, it's been a bit of a roller coaster, obviously, and uh, but you know, thankfully we had a core group of investors that really wanted to see another Canadian champion in public, and um, you know, we're sort of sitting here today as a public company amidst uh, you know, some of the most volatile times since 2008. Can, can you give us uh, some anecdotal um, uh, comments on just what it was like as you were gearing up for the, the IPO this week? Because you know, one thing we heard on the road towards the IPO is maybe your business is the kind that can go public in a market like this because of some of the interest in it. So what, what, what was that like in those final minutes ahead of going public? Yeah, I mean, we spent a lot of time with, you know, a core group of, of long-only investors leading up to the IPO. Obviously, when you're doing a, you know, a $3 billion IPO, yeah, you need a lot of investors to believe in the story and believe in the company and believe in sort of the values that we have as, as a company. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of investors were looking for, you know, some businesses similar to ours that had defensive characteristics, but also had a good growth element to it as well. And I think you sort of put those two in a blender, given where people have talked about in terms of recessions, et cetera, that this is a fairly recession resilient business um, with some growth to it. So I think it, that's what you know investors were looking at for this part of the cycle. And obviously, you know, the, the, the corona buzz that's been going around in the market, you know, there's we're not really sure what the impacts could be to our business, but you know, I think they're very few and far between. At the end of the day, people are going to continue generating waste, and we're going to be there to pick it up. So I think that's what investors really liked about the story, particularly over the course of the last week. Well, we saw a lot of green on our screen at the opening bells this morning because those are your company colors, and uh, people might have seen the green trucks that you guys operate. Why do you see this as a business that, that can navigate all these big worries that we're having? I mean, you talk about people are gonna generate waste, but there's there's gotta be more to it about it. I mean, what else can you tell us about how the business works? I mean, we're a service-based business, and I think at the end of the day, you know, over 80% of our revenue is coming from service-based business. So I think at the end of the day, businesses are still gonna generate waste. We're still gonna have to pick up waste from households. Um, and at the end of the day is, you know, as we say, the internet wave continues to focus on driving more volumes and waste streams to our conventional households. I think that just yields a great result for us. Um, and you know, just given sort of where we are in the business cycle of the demographic of people that have you know created these businesses over time, or you know, a lot of baby boomers are in the industry today that are looking for succession and looking for liquidity. And you know, we've provided a great option for those businesses to actually transact with us. Um, over the last sort of 13 years and you know over the last 13 years completed almost 125 acquisitions and given this sort of public listing I think you know what we're looking for is is the ability to just continue to have access to incremental more capital um, albeit just from a different shareholder base versus our historical way we've created with you know multiple private equity partners over the years I think we're in a very good position and poised for uh, future growth here. So, so a lot of key stuff you just highlighted there, the fact that you have um, built the business through so many acquisitions and now being public gives you something else to, to use as a tool in continuing to grow. Can you give us a sense on, on how much more acquisition activity you could be involved with over the next year or two? I mean, it's always tough to say, but there's, you know, it continues to be a significant amount of opportunity. Um, which I think, you know, we as a management team believe we're poised to continue growing through acquisition as well as all of our organic growth strategies. So, you know, you put the combination of the platform we have in Canada operating in nine provinces in Canada and 23 states in the U.S., we're very well positioned to, um, to continue growing at outsized rates. I, uh, I think we should also give context, and, 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 and some of our viewers may have caught you on BN and Bloomberg before, because we, we've kind of been talking about this road to the IPO for some time. Uh, there was that first push back in 2018. Uh, you ended up doing a deal with BC Partners and uh, Ontario Teachers to recapitalize the business. Uh, November 2019, there was this plan to move towards the public markets. It seemed like the debt load was one of the factors that um, left some investors asking a few more questions. 
questions than not. How did that all prepare you uh, for, for what you've just gone through with, with, with getting to this fi finish line of going public? Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, I think, you know, 2018, you know, was an idea to go public and we never actually formally launched the process. 2019, November was, October, November was our first real go at it and, you know, not really understanding exactly what the, you know, the broader shareholder base actually wanted to see from the company. I think the debt load was a little bit misunderstood just given how private equity views debt versus um, the public markets. And I think we got a very good understanding from public investors about where they want to see the debt load. And I think as you see what we've, and, and as we spent time with them, you know, post pulling the transaction over October, November, really got a very good understanding of, you know, what the core group of investors wanted to see from us. And I think when you look at how we structured the new transaction, both from a yield perspective and an overall leverage perspective, bringing leverage, uh, you know, under sort of four times debt to EBITDA is what the broader investor base wanted to see. And that all formed part of the decision for us to go to the market with the comfort that we know that we had a core group of investors that really wanted to support us um, for the next years to come. I mean, we've ended up certainly talking a lot about the process of, of going public along with your actual business, but it's a very relevant topic here at BNM Bloomberg because as I mentioned uh, at the start of the segment, we don't see a lot of um, IPOs, certainly not of this size, and we're constantly having a dialogue in this country around the worries about you know, foreign investment in businesses in this country. What would, you, what would you say to that about building the kind of business that is going to be appealing not just to investors here in Canada, but globally today? Yeah, I mean, you know, th there are broader themes that are spreading throughout, you know, North America and broadly throughout the world. And I think if you have a company similar to ourselves that has a real focus on ESG related initiatives and, you know, again, trying to make the world a better place. If you look at where what the, the, the investor base that is, you know, come into this transaction, we've had both, you know, North American investors as well as European investors as well as Asian investors that have come into into the deal. And I think obviously building a business that again in this part of the world cycle is recession resilient but has those characteristics of trying to make the world a better place is, is you know businesses that are people are focused on today so you know as esg initiatives continue to to are people at the top of people's minds i think we sort of fit that bill and i think our plan and again the name green for life was, was founded on that premise and being from canada you know, and having a model similar to operating to Europe, I think that's resonated well with investors um, on both sides of the pond. So you made a reference earlier to coronavirus and um, and how um, how you feel about navigating the business through this this time of uncertainty. Could you give us an update, though, on as a company how you're in, uh, preparing your team, employees? Uh, because I think everybody's just curious about how this is being handled, um, and it'd be great to get some insight on on how you're viewing it all. Yeah, I mean, obviously, all the uncertainty has led to, to panic, and I think that's what we are, we are. I think as a company, we've been through you know many uh, different of these. If you look back to sort of uh, the Ebola, and you look back to SARS, you know we have a team that's been navigating those and have navigated those those scares over the time. I think obviously limiting you know unnecessary travel is is, a, is an area of focus and. I think, you know, in Canada and the U.S., we've been sort of relatively lucky at this point. But I think as it evolves over time, you know, we have contingency plans in place um, to deal with our employees. But it's definitely, you know, it's definitely could be impactful in certain respects for the employee base is, you know, if individuals have to be quarantined, et cetera. Um, I would say that's the biggest risk for us. But overall, I think, you know, we're very well positioned to, to weather um, the corona storm. All right, Patrick, thanks for your time this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Patrick DeVigi, founder and CEO of GFL Environmental, big IPO this week. I'm